right, Pat is going to be our next speaker, Pat Harrington. Uh, you may not know Pat. Um, Pat's got quite a long history in nationalism and whatever. Boss of the Solidarity Union, of which I'm a member. And I can tell you that my membership that I have paid has been paid over to me 10, 20, 30 times over in value for money. A very worthwhile thing, the Solidarity Nationalist Union. So a big round of applause for Pat Harrington. Hello, uh, I'd like to thank Nick for inviting me to speak at this meeting and for those in the audience who remained and not been tempted downstairs by computer programs or drinks. Um, what I wanted to do was take you on a historical tour, really. I wanted those of you who are as old as me, I got involved in politics when I was 14 in 1979, and that was a general election year. And it was a year when Margaret Thatcher, um, who some of you may recall, um, she was making a big play about how she understood the fears of those who felt that Britain was being swamped by coloured immigration. She understood their fears. In 1977, only two years earlier, the National Front had received 119,000 votes in uh, a greater London Council election as it then was in London. It beat the Liberal Party in 33 constituencies, which were the same as parliamentary constituencies. So it was on a roll. Between 1977 and 1979, the National Front was subjected to unprecedented attack from the left. Every demonstration, every march, every meeting, you had the rent -a mob attack. They wound up coloured immigrants against the uh, party at that time, the biggest nationalist party as it then was. So it was subjected to a series of brutal attacks from the left. Paper sellers were physically attacked, it was a battle every time they went onto the streets, from 77 to 79. In 1979, Thatcher then dealt the killing blow, which was to say that she would represent people on the subjects that they were concerned about, such as immigration. And sadly, a number of working class people were fooled into voting for Margaret Thatcher. She didn't tell them she was going to shut the mines. She didn't tell them that she was going to destroy our manufacturing industry. She didn't tell them that she was going to make us reliant on call centres which would later be shipped to India. She didn't tell them that by selling off the council houses they were selling the future of their families who would not have new council houses because she wasn't going to build any new ones. She conned the people into voting for her. They voted for her. The reason she got elected was because the votes that had been going to the National Front in places like Essex switched to the Tory party under Thatcher and they got her elected. And the rest, as they say, is history. A history of betrayals. Because shortly after she said she understood people's fears on immigration, she let in the Vietnamese boat people. That was the first betrayal of very many so when I look at UKIP, there's a kind of sense of deja vu, because nothing is new in politics or history, and we have exactly the same thing being played out here. You have a right-wing party making populist noises to deliver an essentially conservative vote. They know that if they go to working people and talk about their economic policies and how they're going to mistreat workers, in their employment, or how they're going to take away maternity pay for women, it's not going to be a vote winner. So they don't talk about those policies. They talk about immigration. They sometimes even talk about Islam to a limited degree. But it's all about stealing votes from nationalists and delivering them to the Conservatives. Because what they hope to end up with is a seat in a coalition government with the Conservatives. Now what you've got to ask yourself is what should the nationalist response to that be? In 1979, because of a poor election result, the National Front fell into arguing amongst itself and into splitting. And that is what the opposition wanted to happen here with the BMP. 
The BNP has not been under physical attack. It's been under legal attack for two years. It's been under attack from people put in to disrupt the party. And the final blow will be for the UKIP to replace you in people's minds and to con people into voting for them. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theory, theorist, but I do believe in convergences. And I believe that people work towards objectives. And I think the script was written that there should be a much depleted BNP, a BNP that didn't have enough money to fight elections properly, faced with a UKIP that was taking away and stealing the clothes of the BNP in its rhetoric so that the BNP would be killed off. And that's what I think the whole script of the last two years at least has been. Now that hasn't happened because the various people, they say that no plan survives the battlefield. And that hasn't happened because people in the BNP have not done what is expected of them in various different ways. And they've responded intelligently to events. However, there's no getting away from the fact that UKIP is a big problem for the BNP because they are doing a siren song to working class people to steal votes from you. And there's possible reactions to that. The reaction of most nationalists in this country has been, we can't beat UKIP, so we won't try. They won't even stand in elections while UKIP's around. The first time that anyone took on UKIP was in Withenshaw. That was the first time that any nationalist had stood up against UKIP and said, these people are Thatcherite Tories masquerading as the friend of the worker, and you should not vote for them. The result was that although your percentage went down from 2010, it didn't go down as much as was predicted. At one point, they were predicting that the BNP would get between 1% and 1.5%. It got 3%. There was even one YouGov poll in the Northwest that put you at 0%. So it can be seen by that percentage and also by the reaction of the media, who were all poised to gloat over the demise of the BNP, and indeed Farage himself, who said, I'm going to kill off the BNP before the election, but had nothing to say after the election. The other interesting thing is the reaction of UKIP to a bit of hassle, if we can put it like that. I'm a, you know, I, I, I see some thuggish types in this room, whose names I shall not mention, <laughs> who I recognise from YouTube. And I recognise them following poor Mr Farage around with a megaphone. <laughs> and I saw Mr Farage run, in, run into a coffee shop, <laughs> rather than answer questions from this man, and exit through the back door. And I read in the Independent that this was very clever of him, that he was able to exit and negotiate his exit from a back door. It was a triumph for him, in fact. It really showed this person and the BNP up that he'd been able to sneak away from them. And I also read, you know, complaints after the election that La the Labour Party and the BNP had given UKIP a hard time. They'd criticised them, they'd <coughs> shouted at them, they'd got a few people even spit at them. And I had conversations with some former colleagues of yours and they were saying, oh, it's terrible that the BNP are doing this to people. You know, it's, it's as bad as the left. But hang on a minute. Cast your mind back to when Nick was outside the Houses of Parliament after his election. Cast your mind back to the fact that he was having darts thrown at I scoured the internet in vain for any statement from Mr Farage, or indeed any UK person, saying that that was not really on that perhaps elected politicians shouldn't be attacked, that it was a bad form to throw darts at MEPs. I couldn't find that anywhere, strangely. So my sympathy for Mr Farage having to exit through the back door of a coffee house is somewhat tempered by the fact that when the BNP was attacked physically by people, he curiously had nothing to say. Now, 
If their reaction to someone shouting at them on a megaphone, or perhaps even spitting at them, or saying something nasty to them, is to run away, what you've got to ask yourself is, are they the people to stand up to Islamic fundamentalists? Are they the kind of tough leadership that this country needs to deal with people who are fanatics and who hate us? Would you put your faith in them as a thin red line between you and them? And I think the answer I would give is not on your nelly. Not on your nelly. These people are cowards and they show it in their behaviour and they show it in their policies because they want to play the same PC game as the rest of them. They just want a seat at the establishment table and they're arguing about what slice of the cake they can have. And once again, isn't that a betrayal? Because the people voting for them are voting for them because they're fed up with the establishment. They know that the establishment is corrupt. They know that the establishment is only in it for itself and has long since abandoned ordinary people. It doesn't give a toss about ordinary people. And yet they're voting for UKIP under the mistaken belief that these people are different. But in fact, they're not different. They're very much part of the same set. They only want to be at the table. They don't want to overturn the table. So what I would say to you is these people aren't genuine nationalists. People will eventually realise that if you explain it to them. And it's a question of challenging them on their policies and on their strategy and behaviour every time you get the opportunity. And Anyone who feels sorry for them should remember that they're in the game of politics. And politics can be a very rough business. When Mr Farage came up to Scotland, to Edinburgh, where I live, he was run out of town because people don't like his policies. And he didn't like the fact that he was being called to answer for them. Nick Griffin came up to Edinburgh for my wedding. Nick Griffin wasn't run out of town. In fact, walked around the centre of the town with me and with the other guests, and people greeted him and walked, you know, shook his hand and said, we're really pleased to see you here. He wasn't run out of town. And I think part of the reason is that people instinctively realise that there's a difference between you and the people in UKIP. Not just a difference in policy, but there's a difference in character. And there's a difference in feeling. And I think that's what you really need to get across to people with UKIP. So I've done a bit of UKIP bashing there, I'm afraid. And I don't like to just bash the opposition. But what I would say is UKIP have to be confronted. You can't ignore them. You have to confront them and challenge them. And you have to educate people about what they're really about. It's a tough gig. And it's going to be difficult to do that in the few months before the European elections. But eventually, it will work. And it will work progressively as you do it. So every time you convert someone away from UKIP, it's another person who's been saved from being misguided. So it's worth doing. The other thing is, where does UKIP come from? UKIP comes from a sort of Thatcherite, Tory kind of background. I was watching a film not so long ago called The Spirit of 45 and it was about the Labour Party victory in 1945 after the war. It was about some of the things they did. They nationalised mines by introducing the National Coal Board. They built substantial council housing. They created a national health service. And all in a very short space of time. And the idea behind that, partly, was that people didn't want it to be the way it was before they sacrificed things in the Second World War. They want, and in a sense, it was their reward for winning the war, that things were in some ways improved. It seemed a shock at the time that Labour got elected, until you realised that Labour 
had been in a coalition government during the war where they held three key ministries and had considerable experience of you know, planning things. But I was watching that and I was watching the happy faces of the old newsreels. If you watch the old newsreels, it's almost like it's a different country. You know, you watch the social solidarity that existed and you watch just the people in those films were totally different. And you look at now the institutions that we've got now, the National Health Service, the Welfare State, the Council Housing. Again, how it's been sabotaged. How it's not about helping people who are deserving and in need. It's been manipulated and sabotaged by successive governments. And I would suggest to you that nationalists are more in tune with the spirit of 45 and the ordinary people than any of the politi other political parties, including UKIP. And if people want to return to a situation where there's a state that actually cares about them and actually attempts to work in their interests, then to look to the establishment parties, including UKIP, is a very mistaken hope. So I would recommend that film to you. I think it's interesting on a number of different levels. But whilst that was the Labour Party, the socialists in that era, coming out of the war, actually did care about people. And you can tell that from their actions, because they tried to build them decent housing they tried to give them a health service. That is very different from the Labour Party of today. Very different. So what I would say to you is, when you're considering UKIP, they cannot compete with you if you go to your roots. If you go to the roots of why nationalism exists, what its aim is for, which is to empower and improve the people and safeguard their interests, that is such a strength that no party will be able to overcome you. But you have to draw on that strength. You have to explain to people that your core essence is the people. That is what a nation is. And your core motivation is to safeguard their interests and fight for them. If you can do that, you'll cut through all the flim flam. You'll cut through all these con artists Right? That is all you need to do. Thank you.